I once wrote that my books are about places to escape to when I've had enough of the modern world. After 60 years of travelling, that sentiment remains true. Although now 84, I have another book to write. So this gentle stroll has a purpose. I'm in training for yet another adventure. Today I'm planning a route that will take me back to a country that in places is the least civilised in the world. My destination is Indonesia, and in particular the western half of the island of New Guinea, a province called Irian Jaya. I'm going to three places. First, to the remote village of Enderman. Then west, through the fertile Bellium Valley. Then west again, to the copper-rich mountains and a town called Tembakapura. As a rule, I'm interested in a country if it meets three criteria. The place should be as inaccessible as possible, the government should be despotic, and malaria should be rampant, because that keeps the tourists away. So it and Jaya fits the bill almost perfectly, and it's probably the last place on earth where in a journey of a few hundred miles, I can travel back 10,000 years to the Stone Age. The rugged mountains that form the spine of Irian Jaya are as impenetrable as any place on earth. This is cannibal country. This is the grim ritual of Stone Age War, a dance of death practiced for 10,000 years. The Yali warriors call themselves the men of power, for all time lords of the earth. But to kill an enemy is not enough. The dead will return to haunt you if the corpse is not disposed of. So far, the sheer difficulty of getting here has protected these people from the advance of our ruthless age. 25 years after man first stepped onto the moon, much of Irian Jaya remains unexplored. October the 20th. More than six days after leaving England, the film crew and I have arrived in Endomen. I've paid a small amount to Chief to sleep on the floor of a makeshift shack. I share a bathroom with my new neighbours. It looks as though I will not be as uncomfortable as I feared. What plumbing there is intrigues me. I wonder how far down the mountain the side this thing comes. It'd be interesting to go up and check, wouldn't it? It probably goes up quite a way. Another thing I find it curious is that this thing why it should be yellow. It must be running through earth further up than that. I pick my way gingerly, like a traveller alighting from a time machine. My Indonesian interpreter tells me that the village of Endoman was contacted by missionaries just a decade ago 
and that apart from them, I have the privilege of being the only white person to visit here. Yeah. That's a rather neat little house right there, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Those are obviously the least yeah. successful. I feel an intruder and approach with some trepidation. The Yali are courteous, if a little bemused. I love the way he, he just sits there, uh, tremendous dignity, very pleasant man. Uh, I love that, that ball pen. Uh. Well, they're certainly friendly. My first impression is of a reserved and dignified people. They are friendly and gentle, far from the ferocious savages I had been led to expect. The first missionaries to arrive in Irian Jaya encountered proud, warlike tribes who thought nothing of killing 20 enemies and then eating them. Revenge was their code, and intruders approached at their peril. But in they came. The white gods fell from the sky, swooping over the treetops to drop sackloads of gifts, steel axes, metal knives, exotic vegetables, and miracle cures. The 20th century in all its glory. Mesmerized, the locals offered their souls in return for material possessions. They burnt all their ancient totems and fetishes in a ceremony which symbolized held fire, the certain punishment for those who resisted. Here in Imdaman, Christianity is still a novelty. Chief Urigeng and his young warriors are proud of their ancient ways. Uh, the chief uh, we hear was a famous warrior and fought in a number of tribal wars. Would you tell us how many men he killed? How, how did he kill the people? Uh, would you tell us when the last war took place? <coughs> How many people would have been killed in that war? Roughly? It transpires that Chief would again kill five men in a recent war, but I am learning that it is easy to underestimate these people. They are outwardly courteous, but the penalty for offending can be drastic. The missionary Stan Dale was an Australian ex-commando. Stern and uncompromising, he tackled converting the Yali as if it were a military assignment. Driven by his absolute belief in Protestant evangelism, he made a fatal blunder. To him, the Yali believes in nothing more than a monstrous satanic deception. He saw nothing wrong with building his airstrip across their sacred burial grounds. In late September 1968, Stendhal paid the price for his unwelcome efforts. He died, here, in a hail of arrows. He was butchered and eaten. I want to know more. I have become friendly with a young man called Katin, but cannibalism is a delicate subject, and I must not overstep the boundaries of good taste. Now, how long is it, do you think, since someone has been eaten here? How long? Sudah waktu mereka berperang seperti kepala suku ada itu, dia itu mereka itu makan manusia. Have you ever? been in the position to see somebody being eaten? Have you ever seen it? Have you any idea what human flesh tastes like? Yeah. 
gemuk seperti babi ya, begitu ya. Seperti babi. Tapi kuning, dagingnya kuning. No one will admit it. After all, the Indonesian government has declared it illegal. But it is clear that cannibalism still exists. But not here, my friends tell me. Maybe in the next valley. Here we ate only pig. The lightly steamed pork is the cordon bleu of area Jaya cuisine, and the pig feast is a very special affair. I am the guest of honour, but keep a respectful distance. I find it hard to believe that many of these men may have tasted human flesh. Uh, of course I'm suffering from shock. Mine, I'm suffering from shock all the time, but I'm, <laughs> I'm suffering from shock when I got up this morning. But, uh, yes, I think, I think any new experience is a little bit of a sort of more effort than I normally put into life. I tend to drift along and it takes me terribly easily. 50 years of experience has done me no good at all. Most people would profit by it, but I've just got 50 years old and that's all. Chief Urigain is the perfect host. I am given the freedom of the village. As I look round, it is striking that, as so often is the case in tribal societies, the women are second-class citizens. Their role in life is to bear children and do all the hard work. The other religion dictates that they must live together in their own houses, apart from the men. They appear very subdued. I am told they have a suicide rate ten times that of the men. I end the day in a state of uncertainty, weighing up the pros and cons of life in Enderman. My doubts extend not just to Yali culture, but to my own. As Burke, the 18th century philosopher, said, custom reconciles us to everything. If our mothers had fed us human flesh from infancy, which of us would have rejected it in later years? But now there's another factor. Christianity has arrived here. Today's sermon has the congregation chanting Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But what can those names mean to people who have no concept of Ilian Jaya, let alone a man called Christ who lived 2,000 years ago in the Middle East? <laughs> Has Christianity freed them from the fear of their ancient vindictive ghosts, as the missionaries claim? Or have they not merely exchanged old fears for new? <laughs> What do the missionaries tell you will happen to you if you don't become Christians? What does hell look like?
After six days in Emblemen, it is time to go. Low clouds make flying here impossible for weeks on end. So I am glad to see the missionary plane land safely on the carefully manicured runway. I live with great affection for Chief Uri Gang and his people. My pilot is an American fundamentalist Protestant, the ever cheerful John Strauss. We had a good time here? Yeah, we had a good time. And okay. They're very nice people. Good. Good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this is a different response than you would get in uh, coming here maybe 20 years ago. What would have happened now? Well, back then they were cannibals. There's the, where they have sacrifices, and uh, yeah, you might be for dinner, but a different kind of dinner. <coughs> well, yeah, uh, uh, do, do, does it still exist in remote parts? Well, there's probably some isolated places, they claim, that are still, you know, untouched and uh, still of that, but as a rule, they're not. But, uh, Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you that we're able to see the beauty that you've created here. We do ask now that you would take and protect us and give us a safe flight as we travel. We do pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Awas! Thus we are commended to the divine eye that recalls even the fall of a sparrow. My flight towards the 20th century is either 40 minutes by air or 10 days hard trekking. As I look down at the river where Stan Dale met his end, I decide that the plane perhaps is not such a bad invention after all. For 10,000 years, the highlands of Irian Jaya have been completely impenetrable and free from outside interference, that is, until recently. The fertile Ballium Valley, the highest in New Guinea, was first discovered in 1938 by an American pilot. He was surprised to see such well-planned agriculture and irrigation systems. Wamana, November the 7th. Endoman represented the past. This is the present. And the present brings portents of the future. Locals are having to make room for Indonesians escaping from their overcrowded islands to the west. With them come some of the comforts of the 20th century. <laughs> My driver admin shows me to my new home here. A holiday chalet set in exotic gardens. That's all right. This is uh, Thailand here. Yeah, that's, that's marvellous. That's good. Any snakes about? Uh, uh, look at that, a bar. Does it have hot water too? No, uh, you must be order. Fantastic. You have to order. To order for yeah, you, you order the water, eh? That's very, uh, very charming. Put all these things down there. Uh, I hope there are no snakes about, but it's nice than that. Antibiotics. 
Insurance policy. Spectacle case. Medical drugs, travel insurance, sensible shoes, all the trappings of an international traveler. And in this new age of travel, nudity has become a marketable asset. Good heavens. What an extraordinary situation. But uh, very spectacular, isn't it? Having taken his picture, we must pay the reward. So every time we go in and out, we shall see that extended hand with that uh, very significant gesture that goes with it. There it goes now. Wow. This is how tourism debases native culture. The meaningful becomes the merely picturesque. Out of the town, the Dani people live much as they always have. But the Indonesian government determined to bring them into the 20th century is making changes. Benny, my Dani interpreter, is taking me to meet the man the government has endorsed as the big chief of the region. His name is Chief Daoki. In its own way, the traditional Dani compound is architecture of the highest order. Entering by the style gateway, one is surrounded by thatched longhouses with double walls for insulation. The women's quarters are separate. This is the men's house. Yes. And around here, it is for women house. One kitchen, one family. Each one of the chief's wives has her own kitchen area. Yeah, own kitchen. That's a very sensible plan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are these houses here? Rowing in a big man. Yeah. It's a cheap man. Yeah. Franked by his henchman, Chief Dolke stands guarding the men's hut from inquisitive eyes like a naked emperor. Chief Dolke, I am delighted to meet you. How are you? We are very honoured to receive your invitation to your great pig feast, which we will accept with huge enthusiasm. The chief's greeting is polished, no doubt from much practice. The Indonesians have chosen wisely. He is the perfect Stone Age ambassador who, dressed in a suit and tie, would be completely at ease in any one of the world's capitals. With bracelets of intertwined pig scrotums on his wrists to ward off ghosts, he makes even a short stroll to his official car look like a royal progress. It is clear that Daoki is able to embrace the modern world while remaining true to his own background. He is immensely likeable, and I should be sorry not to see him again. Some years ago, the Indonesians built these modern huts, hoping to entice the Dani out of their smoke-filled houses. But the policy was doomed. Throughout Indonesia, the government has made hundreds of thousands of these, yes. and nobody really likes them anywhere. Yes. But above all, the Danis don't like them because they are used to living in compounds with the women in one house, mm -hmm. the men in another house, right. the children in another house, the pigs in another house, and the cooking department in, yeah. no in another uh, area. Now, can you imagine their horror when they come here mm -hmm. and they're presented with a place like this? Let's have a, a, a measure of the size. One, two, three, four, five. All right, that's five and a half yards to there. The width now. One, two, three, four, five, six yards depth. Now, the people that lived in this shacks have just gone around the back and have built themselves these traditional houses uh, in which they now live. 
This is where they live, where they keep their wives separately. Um, the men live in their own part of the house. That is their solution. They've turned what was an ideal governmental village back into a traditional uh, Dali settlement. Operation Koteka was another futile attempt to change the Dani ways. Koteka means penis sheath, and the plan was to forbid the wearing of it. Prohibition failed, and harsh measures were stubbornly resisted. The government now hopes that the present invasion of Indonesian immigrants will dilute Dani nationalism and bring about change with their consumerist culture. And so Wamena is now essentially an Indonesian town. But since the outlawing of traditional warfare, the Dani have focused much of their energy on market trading, and the heart of Wamena is still pure Dani, providing the spectator with an interesting cross-section of Baliam life. If these succulent rats for sale dwarf their European cousins, so do the vegetables. The Dani are famous gardeners. You've got such a fantastic richness of soil and such a competent uh, gardening technique here that they produce these plants. When I was here only two years ago, only two years ago, they were showing the first carrots. The missionaries had persuaded them to grow carrots. And almost immediately, they, and they are everywhere. I don't think they eat them themselves. They, they practically still eat only sweet potatoes. They just don't like the taste of these things. There's been a fantastic development in the variety of everything they sell here. I would say it could be as much as between four and perhaps even ten times as much as even, even, even two years ago. And this is done by people who are still basically Stone Age people, although they use iron tools. Yet so important was their technique that they could immediately produce this plethora of vegetables. I have been dubbed Chief of Writing by Benny Maidani Guide. So a tour of the Balliam Valley requires a mode of transport appropriate to my status. For most of the 70,000 Dali, it is a life of subsistence. The most valuable medium of exchange is the pig. If a man needs a wife, that is how he pays for her. So perhaps it's logical that a Dali woman should occasionally suckle piglets. The staple diet of the Dani is a sweet potato, and there is the potential here to produce far more than they need. Life is good here, and the Dani culture thrives. There is one man I very much want to meet, Chief Oba Horok. He greets us with the now familiar wa, which means welcome. Delighted to meet you, Chief Oba Horok. Very nice to meet you. I hope you're well. Chief Oba Horok hit the international headlines in 1974 when he became the first Stone Age man to marry a modern American woman. The Californian anthropologist Bryn Sargent came here to study Dani culture, but instead became part of it. You became world famous for marrying the American anthropologist. The chief and his number one wife, Aku, told me the story. Why did you marry each other? Uh, was she very beautiful? How many wives did you have at that time? 
Uh, they, they all got on well together, did they? Your, your American wife and, and your Dali wives, they all were friendly and happy together. Uh, did she work with the other wives in the gardens with a digging stick and uh, did she look after the pigs? The Indonesian government took a very poor view of the marriage. At that time, they were doing their best to get the Dani out of their penis sheaths and into their pants. Miss Sargent would be a damaging witness to their efforts. She was refused an extension to her visa and hustled out of the country. Chief Oberhorak was never to see or hear from his American wife again. When Wynne Sargent left you, were you all very sad to see her go? Well, it's very sad that this uh, marriage had to be split up in this way. Oh. With nine other wives to console him, I suppose things could have been worse. But why would Wynne Sargent want to be part of such a primitive society? I pursue my conversation with his favourite wife, Aku. She describes the cruel rituals she has been subject to as a young girl. such a hurry. Oh, that's a curious part. Yeah. I have been invited to yet another pig feast. The family pet until today is about to be ritually slaughtered. They look very unhappy, I think. They're alive, but uh, that, whether that one's alive is probably in a state of extreme exhaustion and fear. <laughs> Dani feasts, like their warfare, are designed to placate the spirit world. Failure to do so might bring a terrible fate. Prosperity, even survival itself, depends upon correct observance. The pig feast is also an occasion to show off. The prestige of the local big man depends on the size and the munificence of his feast. Like any occasion where honour is at stake, pride can sometimes be hurt. Well, the last one I was at, uh, there was almost, it appeared there was almost fights broke out the last one, everyone waving and shouting. <coughs> the chief is angry with us. So. We're standing when we should be seated. But there's an even more frightening prospect. We may be asked to partake of this feast. If we aren't careful, we're going to be offered meat shortly. 
Some of the, the inside is absolutely pink. So the half cooked. <coughs> See, that's very slightly cooked. So you get a disease from it. But first, the ancestors must be honoured. The chief is setting aside carefully selected pieces of pork. These are offerings to the dead. The young men of the tribe will hide the offerings in secret places in the forest. How do the Dani reconcile these pagan beliefs with their Christian conversion? Kalau orang Kristen Katolik, pastor bertahankan adat, akhirnya dua-duanya berjalan. Adat dengan itu tidak sebedakan. Semuanya sama. Kita makan apa apa kerana semua kebutuhan. Setelah itu potongan pertama diangkat itu untuk pastor. Yang kedua itu pastor baru budaya dan setempat. Berikutnya itu dibagi-bagi yang di mana ada tempat adat. Seluruh dua desa, Astipo, Aslokbal. Aslokbal dengan ya, Astipo. Uh, it's time to say farewell. You say, you say Naya. Naya. Uh, if the chief is still annoyed by our ignorant behavior, he conceals it. All has gone well. The spirits are placated and traditions have been observed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he seemed, very, he seemed very pleased about it. Yeah. 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 Back to Wamana and the 20th century. A high school marching band parades. These circus antics seem to belong less to Balian than to Barnum and Bailey. Aloof and inscrutable, the governor appears oblivious to any cultural confusion. sad to say farewell to these remarkable people, but I'm off to the future, to the sacred mountain and the great copper mine in the sky. To the west of Ramana lies Irian Jaya's highest peak. Locals call it simply the Snow Mountain. They consider it sacred ground. In its shadow I see the future of Irian Jaya. This used to be a mountain. Now it is one of the world's largest copper mines. Freeport Corporation, an American multinational giant, has the mining rights. Nearby, they have built a pace-setting town they call Timbakapura. 
It is 100 kilometers from the coast to the site. Gradients are so steep, this road has had to be literally carved into the ridges of the razor-backed mountains. This is one of the most formidable construction feats ever attempted. For 20 years, the operation has been shrouded in secrecy and Freeport has only recently admitted journalists. My guide is Freeport's community relations officer, John Cutts. Is that so? Did they in fact shave the top away? There was some, it was said that originally there was only about four feet on, on, on the narrowest point at the top. Right here, we're in a spot right, just right exactly there. like that, just where it's there. a drop off on both sides. And uh, we'll go over areas in this road where they've literally taken the top of a ridge line yeah. and they've shaped it off so that we can drive across. Well, is, what sort of a trot is there if you make a mistake and find yourself hold into eternity down there? You could probably estimate just roughly easily a couple thousand feet. Two to three thousand feet just straight down. At 10,000 feet, the road has come to an end. The only link from here up to the mine is the cable car. Vehicles and machines, some of them huge beyond the imagination, are taken apart and hauled up through the rain clouds to the 12,000 foot site. Only an El Dorado opportunity could generate investment on this scale, and this is just what Freeport has. One of the world's largest deposits of copper. This is the mining shelf, from which the Indonesian government hopes a new glittering future will arise. A 600-foot mountain of solid copper called Erzberg has been bulldozed out of existence. 25 million tons have already been extracted. At least as much remains. It seems Freeport is on to a winner. This is a typical piece of ore. Uh, See the copper minerals. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? That's the copper, which shows, in fact, yellow in color. It does look yellow. Yeah, yeah. It's copper and sulfur. Copper and sulfur. Ha. These are different uh, yeah. Yeah. copper minerals. Yeah. It's exceedingly heavy, isn't it? Yes, it is. Very heavy mm. indeed. The copper occurs yeah. in small veins that go clear yeah, yeah. through the rock. I suppose you never saw the original iceberg when it was just a, a great big pillar no, over. No, that, that must have been an incredible sight. It was. What was it? 600 or 800 meters, or was it? Or, or feet? Or, a feet, I wasn't think 600 it? 600 feet, yes. 200 meters. Sheer, sheer, polished ore. Freeport is literally moving mountains, but this is only the beginning. Freeport has already extracted 31 million tons of ore from the Erzberg, recouping their original investment. But now they've discovered fresh deposits of copper and gold, totaling more than 600 million tons. And there may be even more to come. That night in my room, overlooking Timbukapura, I try to collect my thoughts. I am astonished by the sheer incongruity of a billion dollar enterprise that thrives in the heart of a Stone Age culture. In the morning, I wonder, what are the local people, the Aryan giants? After all, this land once belonged to them. What do they make of it all? As a missionary, John Cutts spends much of his life among tribal people here and offers to find some of the answers. Maaf 
Word of the prodigious feats of the white man soon spread, and with it the hope of rich pickings, inevitably shanty towns sprouted in the lower valleys. But the modern world has no place for Stone Age man. Freeport requires a 21st century workforce, quick thinking and adaptable. These workers are mostly Indonesians or foreigners. When the locals realized there was no place for them, they rebelled. I asked John Cutts in his role as Freeport's official representative what happened. Uh, isn't it a fact that uh, uh, there was a, uh, an, act, an act of sabotage against the, uh, your slurry, slurry pipe a number of years ago in which uh, I think there was a, perhaps uh, some fighting went on? Mm -hmm. Was, uh, I was, again, not at this site, yeah, but I do know what account you're yeah, yeah. talking about. I believe that was in 1977, if it's I'm not mistaken. Ago, yes. And if you'll look through the records of yeah. the history of uh, Erie and Jaya during the 77 up yeah. to the 80s, there was a, a good bit of uh, uneasiness and uh, even a, a bit of uh, agitation that from is, rebel factions. That true. And that was kind of at the height of, of yeah. some of that agitation. Yeah the rebels were able to come in and agitate some of the people and, and uh, have this, this pipeline cut. I believe it was just up on the hillside uh -huh, here, if really, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. The Indonesian army was called in to protect the pipeline. The poorly organized rebels were driven underground. Freeport too went underground in search of the remaining three million tons of copper. Profits look set to exceed all expectations, but Freeport now recognizes that they must take the original owners of the land into account. This is a conflict all too familiar to me. On one hand, the global market with its remorseless appetite for resources. On the other, a Stone Age people who may be participating in the destruction of their own culture. The policy now, they say, is to employ local labor. But ethnic people the world over whose lands are invaded are offered only unskilled and poorly paid jobs. More copper mountains await the miner, but how far will these benefit the Iranese? Anywhere you travel, you see Irian in a state of change, and this is exactly what is happening. You can't sit here and protect little pockets of people and think that you're doing them the privilege of protecting them from the outside world. It is changing. It is going to change. What better way to help these people than to help them understand those changes and maybe develop some skills that they can market as these changes come about? Community development is now Freeport's new corporate philosophy. This is furniture for a new school. Change is inevitable, says Freeport. And education is the key. No one here can read or write, but future generations will have a stake in their own destiny, they say. This is... Uh... Desks, tables, chairs for the new school that the people have worked together here. They have worked for about a month and a half to build the school. It took them several months to mill all of the lumber to build the school. And it was an opportunity to teach some carpentry skills and at the same time put some very, very important infrastructure into their area. The local tribes celebrate the completion of their school. The children sent to these schools will be taught Indonesian, 
will work for Indonesian wages and pay Indonesian taxes. Still, porters are to be enjoyed. Why should they fear for the future? If you feel an upbeat about this group of people, I think the whole reason is probably they've just finished working together as a community to build this school and the, the uh, building for their teachers. And it's just kind of a final culmination of, hey, we accomplished it. All these different, there are seven different clans here, seven different clans, and they've all worked together uh, to accomplish this community project. And they just feel really happy and, and uh, upbeat about it. These people now have their school, thanks to Freeport. But my mood contrasts sharply with the euphoria around me. Over the period of a month, I have visited the past, seen the present, and glimpsed the future. In the course of 20 years, a proud and unique people have been subdued and then brought to healing. It will be real progress to find that in 20 years' time, anything remains of this spirited and dignified culture. Change, inevitable or not, is not always progress, 